Hi everyone, let's talk about nuclear chemistry. We're talking about the center of the atom and um, it's more physics and chemistry, I have to admit, but it's pretty cool stuff regardless. Let's take a look. We got some PowerPoint slides here to guide us. Maybe, <laughs> there we go. All right, nuclear chemistry, chemistry of the nucleus. Um, say reactions. There's a chemistry, but really these are nuclear reactions. They're changing the nucleus, the nuclear structure. Got some, well, should have turned this off. <laughs> it's a little slow, but here we go. Um, so when we talk about nuclear chemistry or nuclear reactions, we're actually changing one element to another oftentimes um, because you change the nucleus, as soon as you change the number of protons, that determines its identity, and so it can change into, into a new element. Um, second bullet point, protons and neutrons. Yeah, part of the nucleus. These reactions consume or release a tremendous amount of energy, thousand times more than normal chemical reactions. So if you think about detonating a stick of dynamite, there's a lot of energy in that. But if you do a corresponding nuclear reaction at that scale, now we're talking atomic bombs, right? Huge is huge amount of, of energy. Um, interesting enough, you can't speed up or slow down the rate of reactions using external forces like you can with chemical reactions, right? Chemical reactions, nope, you're just swapping electrons. You're not changing one element into another. It's usually the outermost electrons. Electrons on the surface, we know them as valence electrons. Um, yeah, small amounts of energy. And then rates can change with concentration, pressure, temperature, catalysts, things of that nature. Um, things you already know, the nucleus, the nucleus is a very small part of the atom, concentrated center where all the protons and neutrons are, not on the exam, but the theory is that protons and neutrons themselves are made of fundamental particles called quarks. Um, there's the diameter of the nucleus, pretty tiny. Yeah, all the mass, essentially almost all the mass, the electrons have some mass, but most of the mass of the atoms concentrated in the center, small volume, so it's a very dense area volume. And what holds these things together, right? Protons are all positively charged. Electrostatically, they're repelling each other. So how do you get these protons, positive charged particles that repel each other, how do you get them so densely packed together? Well, the theory is there's a nuclear strong force, the strong nuclear force, that's overcoming the electrostatic repulsion and holding these protons really close together. However, this nuclear force is very short distance, short acting. So in the nucleus where everything's packed tightly together, it's strong holding things together. But if you distort the nucleus a little bit and the, at, and the protons and neutrons start to separate from each other just a little bit, the nuclear strong force falls off. It stops working. And suddenly now you have these positive protons repelling other positive protons and things fly apart, you break the atom apart. This is interesting here. So um, let's just go through this math and we'll talk about the physics, the chemistry be, uh, behind it in a second. Let's look at the normal helium atom, right? Helium, one of the noble gases, it's inert, comes in with two protons. That's what makes a helium. And the most common isotope of helium also has two neutrons. Protons and neutrons weigh about the same, right? So the mass number is four. So that explains, that's my pen. Right, so that explains the mass number four up here and the proton number, the atomic number, sorry. Also the proton number, number of protons, two. Okay, so we know that there's two protons and two neutrons and how many electrons are in helium? Same number as the protons, right? Everything's balanced, neutral. Helium atom has two electrons. Okay, well, we've done some experiments where we separately measured the masses of these particles. So one proton is known to be 1.0073 atomic mass units. A neutron, 
We got some weight measurements on that, 1.0087 atomic mass units. Electrons, they're much lighter, about 2,000 times less massive as a proton or a neutron, tiny number, but there's two of them. So let's add up all those masses as if they existed independently, and we get this number. That's the total mass, but <laughs> You can actually go into the lab and measure the mass of a helium atom using a mass spectrometer. And the mass of a helium atom is less, 4.0026. And it's like, well, what's going on here? Um, this instrument is one of the ways you can get at some of these numbers too. And there are other ways of getting the weight. So took some work checking the instruments, making sure the data wasn't incorrect. No, it's correct. There actually is a loss of mass when you assemble all these individual pieces into one atom. It's called the mass defect. It's defective or it's short on mass. And you can calculate, well, how much is, of the mass is missing? Well, if you weigh out the individual particles, separately weigh out two protons, separately weigh out two neutrons, separately weigh out two electrons, you get this amount. The actual atom weighs this, so subtract the two, and there's the missing mass, the mass defect. Okay, why? Well, Einstein has a nice famous equation that will help us figure that out. What's Einstein's most famous equation? E equals mc squared. Okay, so m is a mass. So we're missing some mass. Where'd it go? it's changed into energy. It's actually part of the strong nuclear force. That energy holding these protons together, it's where that energy has been kept. It's been changed where it used to be mass and now it's, like, it's energy. Weird. But that's all the experiments are pointing to. Um, e equals mc squared, E is energy, m is mass, c is the speed of light. And we're gonna square that, that number. Um, three, times 10 to 8. I'll put that on the exam. I'll probably put 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, just to give us a few more significant figures. We got a couple of conversion factors down here. I'll give you those two on the exam. So you can do calculations like this. Okay, so at the top is the heading, calculating the nuclear binding energy. So back here, E equals mc squared allows us to figure out Given how much mass, what's the corresponding amount of energy? And that energy is the nuclear binding energy. Okay, so here's how you run through the calculations. Uh, you'll be given an atom, and um, you'll be given the mass of the atom. It's not here, it's on the previous slide, <laughs> sorry. It's over here, here it is. You're given the mass of the atom, 4.0026. You'll be given the mass of individual protons, neutrons, electrons, and then just knowing, right, you can figure out this chemical formula and just realize, oh yeah, the two is a protons, or go to the periodic table and look up HE, two protons, topic number two. You're told the mass number, and then there's no charge listed up here, so it is a neutral atom, so equal number of electrons. Given the chemical formula, you should be able to crank out a calculation for that atom and get its weight, theoretically, and then go and look at the measured mass that'll be given to you too, and subtract the two to get the mass defect. Okay, so we're coming into these calculations here, already calculated that we have the mass defect. And then one of the cool things of the periodic table is that the atomic mass units, if you have one atom, that's how much it weighs. But if you have Avogadro's number, it weighs the atomic mass units in grams. All you and I are going to do is take the mass defect and change the units of grams per mole. And then to use E equals mc squared, you need to change grams to kilograms. That's a standard SI unit. Okay, so 3.05 times 10 to the minus 5, not grams, but kilograms per mole. That's your mass. Where's my pen? So you're going to start with E equals m c squared, so the m is this number here, put it in there. c, you'll be given that, three times 10 to the eighth, 
meters per second, whole thing squared, multiply them together, and you get this crazy number. And then on the previous slide, it said that these units are equivalent to a joule. Sorry, not the moles. Kilograms, meters squared over second squared is equivalent to the energy unit called joule. So you're just gonna change the units to joules per mole. And now you wanna get out of moles because we're talking about a single atom. So use Avogadro's number. You'll be given that number too. You just need to know how to perform these steps. And after you have the joules per mole, change it to joules per atom or nucleus. If there's one nucleus in an atom. And then you'll be given this number too. It depends on the phrasing of the question. Um, I think for me, if I ask for the calculate the, the nuclear binding energy, I don't know if you guys are seeing what I'm seeing, there's stuff in the way. If I ask you, what's the nuclear binding energy of helium? These are the calculations. And once you get to joules, I'd be cool with that. Now in the homework, they might ask you, express the energy in mega electron volts. So then you'll be given the conversion factor to change joules to electron volts. And then if you divide by a million, you can change electron volts into mega electron volts. There we go. Okay, let's go ahead and try it out. And there we go. Okay, so we got another element here. We got fluorine. Okay, so we're told what the fluorine atom weighs in the lab, it's 18.9984. We got the masses of the subatomic particles. Now it's up to, up to us to calculate the theoretical mass of fluorine, right? So how many protons does fluorine have? Nine. Multiply those together. I did it earlier. You can double check my math. Whoops, I made a mistake. <laughs> 9.0657 AMU, but we're going to change that to grams per mole. I might as well just do it now. Um, how many neutrons are here? Well, forget who it was that showed me this trick. Maybe my college professor. Um, 19 is the mass number, protons plus neutrons. Atomic number is the number of protons. So if you just subtract the two, you get the number of neutrons. So if I had enough room, I'd just put a little minus sign here and do the subtraction right underneath the symbol. That's cool. There's 10 neutrons in this molecule, I'm sorry, in this atom. And if we just slide the decimal place over one spot, that's multiplying by 10. Cool, how many electrons? Well, I don't see any charge. It's not F minus, it's just neutral. So same number of electrons as protons, nine of them. And so that number is, lost my spot, there it is, uh, 0 0.00495. Add them up, add your columns up together, and I got 19.157.65 AMU, atomic mass units, or grams per mole. And so now atomic mass units or grams per mole, you subtract the, the two here, so the theoretical amount's 19 something, actual amount's 18.9984, subtract them, we get the mass defect of 0 0.15925 grams per mole. Okay, what did it want? Milli I'm sorry, that's mega. Mega electron volts per nucleus. Okay, so let's do all those calculations. So this is your mass that you're gonna put into E equals mc squared. So it's 0.15925, oops, wait. That's handy. So we got the conversion factor here we need to um, change grams to kilograms by dividing this by a thousand, right? Because you want, let's see, the, 
you have 1,000 grams is equal to a kilogram. That's something that's not given to you. You should know that one. So that cancel out the grams, you want to divide by 1,000 G. You're left with kilograms. OK, and so let's slide the decimal place over 1. I'm going to change its scientific notation. That should be times 10 to the minus 4, I believe. Checking my math. Yep. And that's kilograms per mole times the speed of light. That should have been given to us. I'll give it to you on the exam. That's squared. And then I left out the units of meters per second because once you multiply times kilograms, that all equals joules. And this multiplied out, I got 1.4. I'm going to keep all my decimal places and round off at the very end. So I know this is way too many significant figures, but let's not have any rounding errors. I'm just, just going to keep everything, my calculator sped out at me. 10 to the 13 joules per mole. That's a J. <laughs> OK, so I use the equals mc squared. I got a j here, yay, but it's milli mega electron volts. So I need to change it with this number. And it's also per nucleus, and I have per mole. So pay attention to the question. It has the units you need to end up in. And just keep track of your own units so you know what to do next. I need to get out of moles and into individual atoms or nuclei. So to cancel out the moles, I need to multiply by one mole. And the conversion factor is Avogadro's numbers on, is on the bottom, which I'll give it to you. And then we need to get out of joules. And that conversion factor is right here. Um, 1.602, that's an L, zero rather, two times 10 to the minus 19 joules for every one electron volt. So this number we got divided by Avogadro's number, divided by that conversion factor, the energy now is pretty big. Where is it? I didn't do it. Um, it's like 148 million or something. I'm just going to put that down here. I know. Sorry, I already rounded off. I didn't write it down. Um, but what you have to do is change, this is an electron volts, right? EV, electron volts. And they want it in mega electron volts. So 1 million electron volts is equal to 1 mega electron volts. So divide that by a million. And I apologize. I didn't write down my calculator. I just divide this whole thing by a million. Final answer, check my math, should be 148 mega electron volts per atom, because I divide by Avogadro's number, but, every, but one atom has one nucleus. So there's the answer. That's a binding ener energy for the whole fluorine atom. I looked at it at the homework, and one of the problems didn't want the, the binding energy for the nucleus. And one of the binding energy per nucleon. OK, so read the question carefully. And if you want it per nucleon, nucleon is the word for that describes the particles inside the nucleus. It's either the proton or the neutron. So how many, how many nuclei are, sorry, how many nucleons are in the nucleus, the answer is 19. There's nine protons and 10 neutrons for a total, there's no room over here, for a total of 19 nucleons. So for the whole nucleus, this is how much binding energy is there, 148. But if you want it per nucleon, take 148, mega electron volts and divide by 19, the number of nucleons. And I got 7.8. There's only two sig figs in 19, so let's do that. To 7.8 mega electron volts per nucleon.
There we go. This will be a very common chart that you'll see anytime you're talking about radioactivity. It's got the whole periodic table here. Sorry, the uh, numbers, the font size is so small, but on the x-axis is the number of protons. And on the y-axis is the number of neutrons. This line right here is where x equals y. It's where the number of neutrons equals the number of protons. The shaded region, the two different colors here, is that blue and green? Um, the colored regions, are all the known isotopes, all the known atoms, all the known elements, however you want to describe it. All the atoms that we've seen encountered on planet Earth, they have a spot here. If any place else where there's just blank region, those atoms don't exist. We have never observed them on planet Earth. And among all the atoms that we have seen, the different isotopes, most of them are unstable. This green region, are all the isotopes, all the different atoms that are radioactive. They don't stay around. The blue ones are the ones that are stable, that are not radioactive. Okay, so it turns out, you can kind of see that in the beginning for small elements, it looks like it's a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons, but as the atoms get bigger, the nuclei, get bigger, there's more particles, more protons and neutrons. There are more neutrons required than protons in order to get a stable atom, and even a radioactive one that can exist. Um, yeah, if you have equal number of protons and neutrons way out here, that those atoms don't exist. They, they just can't exist. It's so unstable they weren't even created. Um, whatever. Um, over here, more neutrons. And I guess that makes sense. If you think about the nuclear strong force trying to hold proton next to a proton, they'll have a much easier time holding a proton next to a neutron. So if you put a proton, neutron, another proton, or, or, or in other words, if you put a neutron in between two protons, the protons are just a little bit farther apart and the electrostatic force decreases as a square of the distance. So that's a significant decrease in the repulsive force, the electrostatic repulsive force, by tucking a little neutron in between two protons. So if you have a lot of protons and it's three-dimensional, nature says, let's get a whole bunch of neutrons and set them in between the protons. At least that'll weaken the electrostatic force and give the nuclear strong force a good chance to hold these big atoms together. All right, so um, two takeaways from this slide. One is you increase the atom size and nucleus size, you need more neutrons. Two, if you have this plot, the blue region is where you wanna be for a stable atom. And then you can just map it out. So, you know, you can say, okay, what about, you know, this dot right here? Well, it looks at, look to be about 110 neutrons and about 75 protons, right? So that's that makes us a neutral, um, a stable atom. Just be able to read off the chart where these are. This is not on the test. It's just, just something interesting. Um, nature has her own ways of putting things together. Turns out most of the stable atoms have even numbers of protons and even numbers of neutrons. Odd numbers of either one seem to be less common, so probably less likely to be stable. And if they're both odd, odd numbers of new protons and odd numbers of neutrons, there's only four um, isotopes that and four nuclei that are stable. Weird. So I don't, that's interesting, not on the test. Ah, but that's hinting at, hey, there's probably some something going on in terms of organization and maybe very similar to how electrons are organized into atoms that make stable atoms, right? So electron configuration, the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, and on, on and on and on, right? Those are ways to get the electrons into their own little flight patterns so they can avoid colliding with each other, avoid getting so close to repel each other and send the electrons out of the atom, right? 
So, you know, the P orbitals like the figure eight up down, the other P orbitals figure eight left, right, third P orbitals in and out. And so orienting, positioning those electrons in that shape and those flight patterns keeps them from colliding with, with each other. So nature's probably doing a similar thing in the nucleus. We kind of hinted at it before, let's put a neutron in between the protons, but there's more than that. There's, there's some heavy theory, which I haven't seen, but in nuclear physics, they talk about, hey, let's, let's map out where the protons and neutrons are inside the nucleus to make for a stable nucleus, stable atom, if you will. And it turns out some things come out of that. There are really useful numbers, sort of like the noble gases, electron numbers, um, they call magic numbers of protons and neutrons. So helium has a two, that's a magic number. Oxygen an eight. Um, there's also an, a magic number of neutrons, right? 16 minus eight is eight neutrons. That's a magic number. 20, number of neutrons and number of protons. It's making for stable atoms. So yeah, interesting theory. Um, if you add 82 and 126, that's 208. So 126, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, that is do the math in my head. Um, so there's 126 neutrons and 82 protons and lead, although it's really a large atom, it's actually very, very stable. And it has these magic numbers that make it stable for some reason. Interesting, not on the test. Okay, not on the test. <laughs> it's a neat pattern. Um, we just calculated the nuclear binding energy for fluorine. I forget what it was, was it like 7.2? It was 7.8 mega electron volts per nucleon. If you do that, binding energy per nucleon for all the elements, it's not a constant. Um, for the lighter elements, here's the mass number down here. Um, turns out the numbers are pretty low. They increase as you increase the size of the atom, but after a certain size, the binding energy per mass number is actually decreasing. The binding energy per nucleon, I should say. And so there's an ideal spot where you maximize the binding energy, which if you have maximized binding energy, that's gonna hold the nuclei really tightly together. That's around, I think it's around 56. It's around iron. Iron turns out to be, if you had to say which element on the periodic table is the most stable, It'd be iron. And um, we take some astrology classes. Astronomy, not astrology, yikes. <laughs> astronomy classes. Um, and you study the birth and life cycle of stars. Um, you'll see this, this graph show up there. And it kind of explains how you know, stars, um, you know, start out like our star, a yellow star, burning mainly hydrogen and helium. It's doing fusion. So hydrogen and helium, they don't have a lot of binding energy, but you pack them into bigger atoms and now they're held together more tightly with binding energy. And the fusion actually releases energy. And then, um, gosh, was it the white dwarfs? I forget my astronomy. Um, yeah, they, uh, they break down, I forget how it goes. But a nuclear bomb, is gonna break down to create more stable atoms, releasing energy in a nuclear bomb and a fission reaction, splitting the atoms. And the driving force is to create atoms that are more stable. There you go. Anyways, not on the exam, but interesting information. Radioactive decay, yeah. Um, this is very much related to kinetics, right? So you saw earlier this semester, first zero order kinetics, First order connects and second order connects. Radioactive decay follows first order kinetics. Um, this slide is saying, hey, if you're outside the blue region, if you're in the green, you're unstable. Nature says, hey, do a reaction so you create something more stable. And the way the nucleus can stabilize itself is doing a nuclear reaction to change into more stable nuclei. And we call that radioactive decay. The radioactive atom breaks down, does something, turns into something that was more stable than it was previously. 
Okay. Um, so the nuclei whose neutron to proton ratio lies outside the belt of stability, that blue lines was the belt of stability. If um, you don't have the right number of neutrons or protons, that makes for an unstable nucleus. So it needs to do something, a nuclear reaction to stabilize it. What it'll do, how it decays, depends on where it needs to go to, to get to that band of stability, the belt of stability. It needs to get to the right neutron to proton ratio. Um, conceptually, that's important to know, but you don't need that specific information to do the problems on the test. So this is helpful for understanding why things are, are radioactive. They're just trying to change to become more stable atoms. And why do some radioactive atoms do alpha decay and others do beta decay and others do something else? The driving force is to try and get to the right ratio of neutrons to protons that makes a stable atom. There you go. Oops. Yeah, and then um, all that binding energy, as you change the nucleus, you're gonna release particles and that binding energy is gonna be released. And so that's gonna kick out these pieces of the atom, the nucleus, coming flying out with kinetic energy, lots of kinetic energy. Okay, so here are the known, I don't know about all of them. Here's the ones we're gonna look at. Um, there's alpha particles. So, ooh, okay, so now here's some details that you do need to know. Okay, so um, you do need to know that an alpha particle is essentially the nucleus of a helium atom. It's not helium because it's missing electrons. Oh, fun fact. Do you know where they get the helium to fill up a helium balloon? Well, no one, that's not a jet airliner going up to the top of the atmosphere because all the helium that you release is going to go up there. No, they get it from the ground. So when they dig for natural gas, one of the natural gases is helium. What's this all this helium doing in the rock down below? Well, because Many of the, many of the earth, uh, elements in the Earth's crust is made of radioactive elements that are undergoing alpha decay. They're releasing alpha particles, which are the nucleus of a helium atom. So as a nuclear reaction takes place, an element releases an alpha particle. It's inside the Earth. And so this alpha particle comes out and bangs around, bumps, collides with other elements picks up a couple electrons along the way, and now it is helium. It's not radioactive anymore. No, the helium atom is stable. It came from radioactivity, so it's okay to play around with the helium balloons. It came from radioactive materials, but it itself is not radioactive. Okay, that's the first particle. You need to know it's a helium nucleus. Helium from the periodic table, you'll get that. You can look it up. It's element number two, so two protons double it to get the mass number. You'll need to know that an alpha particle consists of two neutrons and two protons. What else is in, a, in an atom? Protons, neutrons, and beta particles. No electrons, but if the nucleus kicks out an electron, we call it a beta particle. What's really happening is that, let's see if I can remember, I think it's a neutron is breaking down, releasing an electron and a proton, I think an anti-neutrino, not on the test. But anyways, it is possible for the nucleus, containing protons and neutrons, to eject an electron, which we will then call a beta particle. Um, alpha, beta, gamma. So we have protons and neutrons, two of each make up the alpha particle. Beta particle is an electron, got all of our particles, what else is in the universe? Light, right? So gamma ray is just high energy light, high energy electromagnetic radiation. Um, then we have some other ones. Sometimes a free proton or a free neutron can come out of the nucleus. Usually it happens when big nuclei split apart and it doesn't fall apart cleanly into two pieces. It's like you break a cookie, you get two big pieces of cookie, but a lot of crumbs. So if you break the nucleus, sometimes out can pop out a proton all by itself or a neutron all by itself. And then there are times that a proton can break down to release antimatter, the 
opposite of an electron, a positron. It actually has the same mass as an electron, but it has a positive charge. And it does something else, but the proton will change into a neutron that way. I can't remember the, the physics behind it. But anyways, these are the particles. You do need to know what they are, but more importantly, you, you need to know their symbols. So let's talk about that. Let's start with the one you should be most familiar with, and that's just the chemical formulas, chemical symbols rather. We got HE, which comes off the periodic table. The top number is the mass number. Can I use hashtag for number, <laughs> mass number. And the bottom number, the subscript two, is the atomic number. We usually say that's protons, but we're gonna make a little exception in a minute. Okay, mass is usually neutrons and the protons. Okay, so if we look at a proton, what's its, chemical symbol, while well, proton is the nucleus of a normal hydrogen atom. And the atomic number of one proton is one. One proton is one, yeah. Um, and the mass number, well, you only have a proton in it. So there's the symbol for a proton. If you like, the lowercase p is also a symbol for proton. So you could write this instead. The electron. Okay, so what's the mass number of electron? Well, it's much, much less than a, the mass of a neutron or a proton. It's about one two thousandths as much. In other words, if you have 2000 electrons, it will weigh about as much as one proton or as much as one neutron, 2000. Okay, round one two thousandths to the nearest whole number. <laughs> Well, it's less than a half, so you can't round up the one, you have to round down to zero. So the mass number rounded off to an integer is zero. I know it's not really zero, but it's pretty tiny. And then what's its atomic number? Well, it doesn't have any protons. In fact, it's the opposite charge of a proton. So hydrogen has one proton, mass number is one, the electron, that's the same charge, but it's the opposite. So we just define the atomic number to be a negative one. So that's something you need to remember. I had a student say, oh yeah, um, just think about like temperature as you go up in temperature, the numbers increase. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. You got minus one on the bottom and zero on top because zero is larger than minus one. I thought, oh yeah, just remember E minus one then zero. That's a good way of remembering the chemical symbol for an electron, or in this case, a beta particle. Positron, it's a positive electron. So just change the symbol for a beta particle to that of a positive electron, right? So just change the atomic number to plus one, but keep the E there. So understand that it's not a proton, it's the positron, the antiparticle what is that? The anti-electron, antimatter form of electron. Neutron, this kind of makes sense. What's the charge on the neutron? It's zero. The charge on a negative electron is minus one. Charge on a positive proton is plus one. So the charge on a neutron is zero. But what's the mass of a neutron? About as much as a proton. So it's also one, just like the proton mass is one. If you really had to write the symbol for a gamma ray, the charge is zero, light doesn't have a charge, and the mass is also zero. So gamma zero, zero, if so on it asks you for the mass number, atomic number of a gamma ray. I will not ask you for that, but there it is. Okay, so know the chemical symbols for these six particles. And there's some logic behind it. You get to use a periodic table. You kind of went over the patterns. Hopefully you can remember those. You'll need those. <laughs> We're gonna use those. And I'll demonstrate near the end of this video. Okay, 
there's some detail here. It's interesting, but there's a shortcut to get through this on the exam. So I'll show you that shortcut, like I said, at the end of this video. Okay, we had six particles. How come we only have five things happening here? <laughs> We're missing something. Anyway, we'll find the missing one later. Uh, the most common form of radiation are the first three. The Greek letters are alpha, beta, gamma. So very common way of atoms become more stable is by kicking out an alpha particle, kicking out the nucleus of a helium atom. So that's what's highlighted right here. We got a big atom and then two neutrons, two protons come out of the nucleus as a single entity, the alpha particle. And what do you have left behind? A new element because it changed its number of protons. And it does this, it's driven by the fact that afterwards, there's a different ratio of neutrons to protons that hopefully makes it more stable. Actually, not hopefully, it will make it more stable. Otherwise, nature would not allow this to happen. It's not gonna create something more unstable. Okay, another idea is you have a neutron in this big atom that falls apart to create an electron which gets kicked out and a proton which stays behind. And that kind of makes sense, right? Protons are positive, electrons are negative. If you squeeze them together somehow, the plus and minus charges would cancel out and you'd have essentially a neutron. I think you need an antineutrino in there. So anyways, take some physics and get the full story. But for us, beta decay comes about when a neutron changes into a proton and kicks out an electron we don't call it an electron, it really is an electron, but we call it a beta particle. And the whole process is called beta decay or beta radiation. There's another case of radiation where the atom just, it, the nucleus rather, it just reorganizes itself. Maybe if these protons and neutrons are like in different shells, different configurations, it wiggles and reorients. Maybe a neutron gets closer in between two protons or something. And as it shuffles, it's like, oh, okay, that's a little more comfortable. And it releases a gamma ray. And the resulting atom is now more stable. Okay, positron emission. That's where a positive charge comes out. The anti-electron comes out. So what we have is a proton that kicks out the positron. That's this little plus charge here. And what's left behind is a neutron. And then I think this one's the coolest of it all. Um, you have this nucleus that's just not happy, it's, unsa it's unstable, and the 1s electrons are pretty darn close. And with all these positive charges, there's a chance the electrons flying around may actually collide with the nucleus, pretty rare. But here it actually happens, one of the 1s electrons collides with the nucleus, and then the electron pairs up with the proton to make a neutron. And that's called electron capture. And it's a good name for it. And, it gets, and then x-rays come out as a form of radiation. And you're left with an atom that's more stable than what it started with. Now again, these are good details. If you like them, you can learn it. Um, but there's a shortcut to get you through the radiation questions that you might see on the exam. And here it is. So here's the key to the shortcut. It will always be true, certainly with the radioactive um, reactions we see, the nuclear reactions we see, that the total uh, mass before and after will be the same. It's a constant. And the total charge before and after will be the same. In fact, we actually just count the protons the proton numbers will be the same before and after. And if you know that, then you can tackle any of the radioactive problems, radioactive problems, any of the problems dealing with radioactivity that you may see on the upcoming exam. Okay, so here's the generic form. Hey, you got this atom, it's radioactive. There's a proton number, atomic number, a Z number. Uh, the atomic number is Z1 and a mass number M1 and it falls apart into two pieces. Well, is it on, if, if you add up the mass numbers of the two resulting pieces, it'll total the 
initial atom's mass number. If you have the number of protons afterwards, it adds up to the initial number of protons. And that's what it's saying. The masses are conserved. The total mass before and after is the same. And the number of protons are the same. So the total protons before is equal to the sum of the protons afterwards. How do we know about all these? This, yeah, not on the exam, but essentially you get some radioactive material and some x-ray film or something that can detect these particles and pass them to an electric field. And, you know, if you have an alpha particle, what's an alpha particle? You need to remember that. Two protons, two neutrons. So what's the charge of an alpha particle? It's plus two. And so if this plate is positive, the alpha particle is going to be repelled by it. And if this plate is negative, the alpha particle is gonna be attracted. So as the alpha particle comes flying out of this device, it's gonna be deflected downwards. If the reactive material is emitting beta particles, what's a beta particle? An electron that came out of the nucleus. Electrons are negative. So it's gonna be repelled by the negative plate and attract to the positive, it's gonna go upward by the same amount? No, alpha particles are really heavy compared to a simple little electron, right? Four protons, sorry, four nucleons, two protons, two neutrons, and one electron is one two thousandths as much as one of those, so it's super tiny. So a little bit of mass, it's gonna be deflected a lot greater than the heavier alpha particle. If you have a gamma ray, you're going to get a bright spot on this piece of x-ray film. No deflection because light doesn't carry charge. Cool. Close up of the alpha particle that we talked about, alpha emission. Inside the nucleus, kick out two protons, two neutrons as a unit, the alpha particle. You left with something else behind. And now we can do the little math here. So this corresponds to uranium-238. You kick out four mass units, so 238 subtract the four, you're left with 234. Uh, uranium is uranium because it has 92 protons. If you kick out an alpha particle, you remove two of them. So 92 goes down to 90. Your new atom, thorium, is more stable. And it turns out, if you do the math, the number of neutrons to protons, I think, is greater. It's becoming... It's getting to that, what was that called? That band, I keep calling it band, but it was something else, band of stability. I forget what they called it. Anyways, the blue region, right? Getting part of on that one graph. Alpha emission, here's another example, same math. Oh, here we go. Alpha emission increases the neutron to proton ratio, helping it become more stable. But just do the math, right? So 204, um, if you kick out an alpha particle, subtract four, you're left with the mass 200 of your new atom. And if you start with atomic number 82 and you kick out an alpha particle, you're gonna subtract two from 82 and you're left with a new atom of atomic number 80. And then you go to the periodic table and look up, well, which element's number 80? It's mercury. Next slide. Um, neutron can fall apart to produce a proton and kick out the beta particle, the electron. Okay, so this is trying to explain why some atoms, radioactive atoms, kick out alpha particles. They're trying to increase the number of neutrons to protons. There's other radioactive atoms that actually have too many neutrons. So here's a great way to get rid of one, have a neutron break down the form of proton and kick out an electron. And now the atom will have fewer neutrons and now it's lowering the ratio. It's trying to get to that region of stability. So this is beta emission, beta decay, beta radiation, kicking out a beta particle. There's also neutron emission, just kick out a neutron. Nope, this is still <laughs> beta particles leaving. Um, did I miss something? Let me go back and see. Nope. Okay, so here, if I said, hey, carbon-14 emits a beta particle, what's the new atom? 
you would say beta particle, beta particle. Oh yeah, that's an electron. It's minus one up to zero. This is its atomic number. And the atomic number plus the new one has to equal the original one, right? Because the number of protons is constant. And I know it's kind of weird with the minus one here, but the math works. Seven minus one is equal to six. 14 plus zero, remember the electron's mass rounds down to zero. So the mass number doesn't change. It's the same as it was before. All that happened was a neutron turned into a proton. So 14, initially 14 minus six was eight, is eight. Initially there was eight neutrons. Afterwards there's only seven. Yeah, because one of those neutrons turned into a proton. So there used to be six protons. Now there's seven protons. Cover up this, this answer right here. And I, if I asked you, hey, radium, mass number 226 kicks out a beta particle. What's the new element? What did radium turn into? You would say, OK, um, radium from the periodic table has atomic number 88. It kicked out a beta particle, which means the new atom has to have one more than 88 because 89 minus one equals 88. The mass number won't change if it's a beta particle because essentially we round off the mass number to zero. And then that's how you get the new particles, atomic number 89, mass number 220, 226, and use the periodic table to get the chemical symbol. Go look element 89 up on the periodic table and it's actinium, AC. Neutron emission, same thing. Um, kind of boring. <laughs> it just changes the mass number. Hey, what happens if neutron, if ni nitrogen 17 kicks out a neutron? You would say, well, okay, the number of protons doesn't change because the atomic number of neutron is zero, no protons, no charge, but it has a mass number one. So one plus 16 equals 17. So yeah, the new atom. It's the same element because the proton number doesn't change. The mass number decreases, and that hopefully will make it more stable. And do the same thing with iodine down there. OK, so it's talking about other ways to make things more stable. So um, you'd have to be told, hey, argon is going to do electron can't capture. What is the new element? Okay, so argon 37, I have to tell you the mass number. And I'll say, hey, does electron can't capture? What's the new element? So you'd say, okay, the electron symbol is minus one zero. Number of protons has to be the same. So 18 minus one gives you the new atomic number 17. Go to the periodic table and element 17 is chlorine. Cool. And then the mass number of electrons zero, so you start with mass number 37 plus zero, you end up with 37. And there you go. It's chlorine 37 is the answer. When argon 37 does electron cam, uh, capture. Positron emission, okay, I might say, hey, um, potassium 39 emits a positron, what element is created? Okay, so potassium 39 is going to emit positrons. Positron, you ever, you ever watch Star Trek The Next Generation? I remember Data, the android, had a positronic brain. Yeah, no, that's what I think of. Doesn't really help here. Just a little distraction. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so potassium 39 emits a positron. So you'll have to remember positron is, an, is the opposite of electron. So not minus one zero, but plus one zero. And it's a product, it emitted a positron. So whatever the new atom is, if you add one to it, you have to equal 19. Okay, so that was 18. 18 plus one gives you 19. And the mass number doesn't change. Mass of a positron still rounds down to zero, just like the mass of an electron. So it used to be mass number 39, it's still mass number 39. So go look on the periodic table and find out what element 18 is. It turns out to be argon. Cool. Uh, 
Um, if you have uranium-238, that's a natural element, but it's naturally radioactive. It's found in the Earth's crust. And um, the Earth internal or, um, temperature of the Earth is actually being warmed by radioactivity all the time. And the pathway for uranium is it kicks out an alpha particle. So it goes from atomic number 92 down to 90. Why did it lose two atomic numbers? Because uh, an, uh, an alpha particle has two protons. So it started with 92 protons. After one alpha particle left, now it's atomic number 90. And then it, that new element, thorium-234, is a little more stable, but it's still radioactive, and ejects a beta particle. Now, beta particles change a neutron into a proton. So your proton number goes up by one. That new element kicks out a beta particle. So now you're at uranium-234, kind of where you started, but your four mass units lighter. And now you kick out a series of alpha particles that turn into lead. Ooh, lead's usually pretty stable, but isotope 214 is not. That's a radioactive form of lead. So you do a couple beta particles and an alpha to get the lead to 10. It's getting better, it's still radioactive. Two more beta emissions, and then one final alpha emission, and then your lead 206, a very stable form of lead. Yeah, the amount of lead in the Earth's crust is increasing all the time as natural sources of uranium go through this cascade, this chain reaction, and end up as lead. Oh, was that on your test? No, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this, you kind of already know this from kinetics early on in this semester. We talk about rates of reaction, first order reactions. So we're just gonna borrow some of that math and talk about half-life and radioactive decay. So they're doing the math a little differently than I learned it, but I'll show you how to do it in a second. Let's get the information up here. Okay, most of the time you're told about a specific radioactive element and you'll be given the half-life. The half-life, and please, is equal to time for half of the radioactive atoms to decay. Radioactive atoms to decay. Now, what's interesting is we don't know how to predict when a radioactive atom will emit its radiation and become more stable. All we know is on average that if you have a collection of a whole bunch of radioactive atoms, we measured it for some time, it's pretty consistent. The time it takes for half of those atoms to go radioactive is constant. And then the, so you wait for a half-life, the time it takes for half of them to decay away. And now you have to wait for another half-life, that same interval of time, for half of those atoms to go radioactive. And then you have to wait again for another interval of a half-life. And the process just goes on and on until eventually all the atoms have decayed. It takes a very long time, which is why nuclear power plants have such trouble with the radioactive waste, because it takes a long time for it to go away. And all that radiation is hazardous. Here's the math for us. The half-life, it's going to be symbolized with T, one half. Yeah, half-life. That kind of makes sense. The time for half of it to decay, um, 0.693 divided by that lambda. And we had that before as rate equals um, lambda n. And that might remind you of first order kinetics. We talked about the change in the concentration of a molecule per time is equal to k, some rate constant k times the concentration of a. So the lambda and the k are, are the same thing. The rate equals ka, the rate equals lambda n. The math, the computation's the same, but the definition is a little different. Um, when we talked about kinetics, we talked about the concentration of reactant A changing in the products. Here we're talking about the number N, the number of radioactive atoms that are decaying and how quickly they're doing it. Anyways, there we go. Um, 
that's the rate first order rate law. You might remember the this is the derivative form. The integration form was a at some time is equal to the initial concentration of a, so a sub zero times e to the minus kt. Well, that's this equation over here. And hey, <laughs> there is a lambda. This should still be a lambda. They kind of messed up. And then if you solve for t, take the natural log, you get this thing. And I don't remember if you did that. I think you maybe. If you solve this for t, then you get 1 over k natural log of, I shouldn't have put in brackets. Um, that's not an n. Yeah, let's get rid of that bracket. It should be a parentheses. Uh, the concentration of a at some time divided by the concentration of a initially at time 0. These look the same. I will give you these equations. You just need to be able to use them. That's interesting. There's it's explained the half life, right? So, if, whoa, back please. If you start with 10 grams of a radioactive element at time zero, if you go out one half life, then 10 grams, half of it will be five. So, five grams will have done its thing. I don't know what cobalt 60 does. Is it? It might be a gamma emitter. I don't remember. But half of it is now stable, no longer radioactive. But five grams of that cobalt 60 is still there. So you have to wait another half life. So half of five grams turns into two and a half grams of radioactive cobalt still left. And then the other 10 grams, I'm sorry, you initially had 10. So there's another seven and a half grams. Now it's all stable. It's some other element. Not radioactive anymore. Anyways, so that's how the half-life works. Take after one period of time that equals a half-life, you lose half the material. Two and a half becomes 1.25. Half of that is 0.625 and on and on. Okay, so let's do some of this math. Okay, radon 222. There's a chemical symbol for it. Uh, you should be able to take the word or the name of the isotope and turn it into a, a chemical symbol, right? So radon dash, this is always going to be the mass number. That's going to be your superscript. And then use the periodic table to figure out which atomic number does radon have. It's element number 86. So radon on the periodic table, you'll look it up. It has 86 protons. It's element 86. That's how you write down the chemical symbol. Um, ooh, has a half-life, T1 half equals 3.823 days. How long will it take a sample? Radion, radon 222 with a mass. OK, this is the initial mass. Let's call that N sub 0. 0 0.750 grams to decay in other elements, leaving only 0.1 grams of radon. So after some length of time, you'll be left with 0.1 grams of this radioactive material. The equation, wait, what do I want? I want time. So <laughs> you'll get both of these equations on the test. We had this one. And we had the better one, which is the one we want. It's minus one over lambda natural log of n. Why do you use a bracket? <laughs> that means concentration. We don't have concentration. We have numbers. Um, the total at the end and the number of um, atoms at the beginning. There we go. Am I missing something? Let me check. I was just doing that by memory. Yeah, that's right. OK, so of these two equations, how long will it take? That's the time. OK, so what we need is to solve, you know, use this equation, find time. Um, NT, got it. It's 0.1. N sub 0, the number at time 0 is 0.75. Good, got it. Um, what's lambda? Oh, yeah. So we'll, I'll also give you that equation. Um, the half-life is equal to 
0 0.6, what was it, 9.3? Yes, 9.3 over lambda. Okay, and we need lambda. So solve for lambda. Okay, so you just flip flop these crisscross, if you will, or multiply both sides by lambda, divide both sides by the half life, you get this. And now you can just put it in there lambda is 0 0.693 over what? 3.823. 3.823. And that's in days, but it all work out. You don't have to worry about the units. So lambda here, this is number two. Um, I got, again, I don't want to round off too soon. So I'm gonna keep all these digit, digits. And I'll put it right over here, the lambda we just found. Natural log of, yeah, at the end it's 0.1. Initially, it's 0.75. There you go, and get your calculator out. On the exam, if you're showing, if it's a, if this is a show your work pro, um, problem, definitely show your work in case you make a math mistake. I can, yeah, if it's a show your work question where I'm giving out partial credit, then I can look at this and say, oh, got the right equation. Good job here. Maybe hit the wrong button. If the time's not exactly right, I can still give you some good, good amount of points. Um, I got 11.1, don't know why. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, why did I round off the three sig figs? But this one had three sig figs, so this one. This one had four. And then what are the units of time? Days. Cool. That's how you do the math. Um, if you have time in the exam, you might wanna just do a, a quick check and say, does that make sense? Well, the half-life here is about four days and 11 is almost 12. So it looks like it's gonna take three half-lives to get there. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of estimating it. I'm saying, hey, if you start with 0 0.75 grams and you wait four days, that's about a half life. So you should have half of this. So get your calculator out, divide this by half. It's 0.375. If you wait another half life, which is approximately four days, then that half of that is 0.1 something. I did it in my notes here, 875. And if you wait another half life, about four days, half of this is 0.9. 375. And you'll see that this number is less or pretty close to 0.1. And so it does make sense. Yeah, it took about 12 days to get about 0.1. Okay, so now I trust is 11.1 .1 days. That sounds right. This estimate seems to line up with that pretty well. Yeah, this is just me knowing what half-life means. Take half of this, there it is after one half-life, 0.38 days, but I just used four days just to make an estimate. Okay. Okay, we can do another one here. Actually, it doesn't take long. Let's just do it. All right, so what we got? Um, you can read through all this. I'm just gonna go grab the numbers. Okay, so this, this artifact showed a decay rate of 14.2. N, there we go, 14.2 dis disintegrations per minute per gram of carbon. What age is implied by this result? If currently living organisms decay at a rate of 15.3 disintegrations per minute. Okay, this is the time zero amount, and this is, you know, after we let the half-life go, um, this is what's remaining. Okay, so what's going on here? This is carbon dating. So if you want to know how old a fossil is, you can do carbon dating. And what the idea is, it's, um, the information is on some later slides. So this is kind of out of sequence. But the idea is that um, carbon-14 is radioactive. It's not that radioactive. We have some of our bodies. And during our lifespan, 
very few of them are going to radioactively decay. And uh, don't worry, we've been dealing with radiations, radiation our entire life, right? There's cosmic rays, there's uranium in the crust, there's natural forms of radiation, but such low levels that life has adapted to it. We have ways of repairing radioactive decay, um, damage, radio um, damage from radiation. radiation. It, the problem is if you get too much of it too quickly, that overwhelms our repair systems and you can get radiation sickness. Um, the point is, is that carbon-14 is being created all the time. It's just a natural process. And so it exists in our environment all the time. And so you can go and see, well, how much is existing right now? We're assuming that this has always been the amount that existed at any point in time. Way back before they made the Shroud of Turin, it's probably made out of cotton. So at the time that the cotton plant was growing and it made the cotton that was woven into this, this artifact, at that moment in time, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, which was taken up by the cotton plant, wove, you know, made into cotton, was 15.3. And then this artifact doesn't change its amount of carbon-14, right? The cotton plant, cotton plant died and not making new cotton. So now the natural amount of carbon-14 in the cotton is just going to radioactively decay. And now today we can measure how much is there decaying away. And it's 14.2, which is less than 15.3. And now we can use the rate law to figure out how much time has elapsed for 15.3 to go down to 14.2. The time is negative one over lambda times the natural log of what it is now divided by what it was initially. And then we also need the lambda, which is the half-life is equal to 0 0.693, I keep forgetting, over lambda. So flip these, put in 517. So lambda equals 0.693 over 5,715 5, years. And that cranks out to a tiny number. I got to be 1.2126 times 10 to the minus 4, natural log, and uh, the current radiation radioactivity level is 14.2. It used to be 15.3. Get your calculator out, and I got the time to be something, 615. What are the units? whatever the units were on the half-life, years. So based on carbon-14 dating, this artifact is only 615 years old. Okay, so that casts some doubt as to whether it really was the burial shroud of Christ, which was 2,000 years ago. Okay, it's not definitive proof. I'm just saying, hey, this is evidence saying probably not. Hopefully we're not too controversial with this, this homework problem. All right, what else we got? We're getting pretty close to the end here. There we go. Um, nuclear transmutation. Okay, so this is where people kind of get involved. If you want to make some weapons grade plutonium, go get some uranium out of the Earth's crust, the natural forms 238, and bombard it with alpha particles and you can start producing plutonium. And you also kick out a neutron. This plutonium naturally decays into this isotope. Yeah, that's interesting, whatever. The whole point is, if I asked you, hey, what element is created when uranium-238 is bombarded with alpha particles and one neutron is emitted, then you could do this problem. So if I lift, left this out, you'd say, okay, helium, is, I'm sorry, the alpha particle is helium, 2,4. Uranium, I look it up, it's element number 92. 92 plus two is 94. That's the new um, atomic number. 
And I was told also you make a neutron. Well, there's no atomic number. It's zero for neutron. So the new element is number 94, which is plutonium. Then you do the math up here to figure out the isotope of plutonium. 238 plus four is 242, but you got one neutron. So 241 plus one equals 242. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Just add the numbers, make sure everything balances on the top, the mass number, and then make sure that everything on the bottom um, um, balances, make sure the atomic numbers balance, and then use the periodic table to identify the symbol for that atomic number. Cool. Another example. Oh, okay. Um, there's an earlier example with cobalt 60 used as radiation therapy for cancer patients. So to create this, because it's radioactive, it's been decaying away if it ex exists in the Earth's crust, um, just take some iron and bombard it. You have to hit it twice with neutrons, independently strike this once and then a second time with a neutron. And if the neutrons stick to the nucleus, that'll turn it into cobalt-60, which is radioactive and useful as a cancer therapy, radiation therapy. Ah, here we go. Let's end the video here. I've been waiting for this one. I kept talking about the shortcut. You don't have to memorize all those different ways that radiation can occur, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma, positron, neutron emission, and electron capture. It is interesting. If you know it, awesome. But the shortcut is make sure the mass number balances and make sure the atomic number balances. And then you also have to know what the symbols are for the alpha particles, the beta particles, the positron, things like that. All right, here's the main idea. Um, how about if I have the pin? The element berkelium was first prepared at the University of California at Berkeley. Hmm, go figure, Berkeley, berkelium. In 1949, by alpha bombardment. Okay, it's not alpha emission, it's bombardment. So we're going to use an alpha particle and bombard this element, AM, Americanium, Americinium, whatever. And we're told what the atomic number and the mass number are. Two neutrons are also produced. So we're gonna make two neutrons and we're gonna make a new element. What isotope is it? Well, they actually tell you it's berkelium. Let's pretend we didn't get that information. And we're just told what element, what isotope really, the mass number and the atomic number, what isotope is created when americanium, is that the name of it? AM241 is bombarded with alpha particles and two neutrons are also emitted. Okay, you'll then have to, well, you got the information on the isotope you begin with. You'll then have to figure out in your brain, what the heck's an alpha particle? Oh yeah, it's helium. Helium from the periodic table is atomic number two, mass number four. And you're told you start with atomic number 95 and mass number 241. And you have to make two neutrons. Okay, so now you need the chemical symbol for the neutron. Neutrons are neutral. They don't have any pluses. They don't have any minuses. They have zero charge. What's the mass number of a neutron? It weighs as much as a proton, one. Okay, and it weighs something else. Well, Let's call this Z and this M. Okay, so let's balance the mass number and balance the proton number. So the protons, just gonna do that one first. 95 plus two over here, and that looks like a Z. 95 plus two is equal to 97. And that has to equal two times zero, well that's zero, plus Z, the unknown number. Oh my goodness, really? This is 97. This is some element, but it's nine, number 97. Cool. I didn't grab the periodic table, but I think we can trust that it's going to be berkelium. So element 97 is berkelium, BK. 
Let's go to the periodic table, look up 97. You'll find it's the symbols BK for berkelium. What's the isotope? Which isotope is it? What's the mass number? Well, you have to balance it. 241 plus 4 equals 245. And that has to equal 2 times 1 is 2 plus the mass number of the isotope. Subtract two from both sides and you're left with 243. Nice. And that's it. Cool. All right. Take a look at the rest of the slides on Canvas if you like. It has some interesting applications of radiation and other interesting tidbits, but they're not on the exam. So I'm going to close out this video right now. Take care. <laughs>